Hi guys, my name is Dr. Asim and I am here with another teaching video from Plavable. So today we are going to learn a very important aspect of endocrinology, which includes Cushing syndrome and adrenal insufficiency. But before we move on to our main topics, let's brush up our concept about the functioning of hypothalamic, pituitary and adrenal axis. Thalamus, which is a part of our central nervous system, helps in the release of various hormones in our body. One of them is corticotrophin releasing hormone, which is released from the hypothalamus and goes and acts on the anterior pituitary to further release adrenocorticotrophic hormone, which is ACTH, which goes and acts on the adrenal glands to further release hormones like mineral corticoids and your cortisol. If you look at the structure of adrenal gland, it has an outer cortex and an inner medulla. Now here we are concerned about the outer, outer cortex which is further divided into three layers from the outermost to the innermost which is your glomerulosa, fasciculata and reticularis which release hormones like mineral corticoids, glucocorticoids and your sex steroids respectively. Now if we consider Cushing syndrome which is characterized by increased secretion of cortisol whereas on the other hand adrenal insufficiency is characterized by decreased secretion of cortisol as well as mineral corticoids. Cushing syndrome can be classified into ACTH dependent and ACTH independent. Now as we know that ACTH is released from the anterior pituitary, so causes for ACTH dependent Cushing's include tumors of the pituitary gland or there can be an ectopic production of ACTH from a neuroendocrine tumor most commonly from small cell cancer of the lung. Various causes for non-ECTH dependent Cushing's include adrenal adenomas, adrenal carcinomas, or there can be an exogenous administration of glucocorticoids. A patient of Cushing's typically presents with features like moon facies due to facial fullness or supraclavicular filling, buffalo hump or truncal obesity due to redistribution of fat caused by cortisol. The patient also has purple stripe on the abdomen which result due to skin atrophy caused by cortisol and further stretching on the skin. Also the patient can have hypertension due to effect of cortisol on the blood vessels which result in vasoconstriction. Also cortisol increases osteoclastic activity leading to osteoporosis. The patient can also have some psychological symptoms like CNS irritability or depressed mood. So this is, in a nutshell, the presentation of a patient with Cushing. So if there is a patient in whom you are suspecting Cushing's, so you can do any of the three following tests. The first one being the 24-hour urinary cortisol. But if the patient is unable to give the sample for 24-hour urinary cortisol, then we have the option of doing low-dose dexamethasone suppression test or 1 mg dexamethasone suppression test. The third option is late night salivary cortisol. So if any of these tests come positive, so it helps us to make the diagnosis of Cushing syndrome. Now once the diagnosis of Cushing syndrome is established, then we, when we move on to measure the plasma ACTH levels. Now this plasma ACTH levels help us to differentiate between whether the Cushing is ACTH dependent or ACTH independent. After measuring plasma ACTH and if the ACTH levels come elevated, then we move on to localizing the cause of Cushing's that whether it is an ACTH dependent Cushing's is due to an ectopic source like small cell cancer of the lung or whether it is from pituitary adenoma because these are the two places from where ACTH is released. Now this high dose dexamethasone suppression test helps us to localize the cause of the lesion. High dose dexamethasone will be successful in suppressing the elevated ACTH levels from the pituitary source by suppressing the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis in contrast to an ectopic source on which it has no effect and the ACTH levels remain elevated despite giving the high dose dexamethasone. The treatment for Cushing syndrome is surgical, uh, that is the resection of the tumor. However, if the patient is unfit for surgery or for those patients who are awaiting the surgery, we need to control the cortisol levels by giving various drugs like metirapone or ketoconazole. 
that was all about Cushing syndrome. Now moving on to our next topic, which is adrenal insufficiency. Our next topic is adrenal insufficiency. As the name implies, the adrenal gland is not functioning properly, which leads to reduced production of hormones by the adrenal gland. That is your glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids. Now, adrenal insufficiency can be a primary insufficiency or can be a secondary insufficiency. Primary is when the problem is at the level of adrenal gland itself, whereas secondary is the one where the pro when the problem lies at the level of hypothalamus or the pituitary, leading to decreased production of ACTH and hence decreased stimulation of the adrenal gland to produce glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids. important clinical feature to differentiate between primary adrenal insufficiency and secondary adrenal insufficiency is hyperpigmentation. Now in the patients of primary adrenal insufficiency there is decreased production of cortisol from the adrenal gland which leads to increased production of ACTH from the pituitary gland as there is no negative feedback from the adrenal gland to the pituitary gland. So increased amount of ACTH is produced from the pituitary gland which further increases the production of melanocyte secreting hormone, which leads to hyperpigmentation of skin creases. Secondary adrenal insufficiency, there is decreased amount of production of ACTH from the pituitary, and hence there is no, um, no production of MSH leading to hyperpigmentation. So this is a very important clinical finding that the patients of secondary adrenal insufficiency do not present with hyperpigmentation, unlike the primary adrenal insufficiency. The patient of adrenal insufficiency present with common yet non-specific features like abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, muscle cramps, weakness, fatigue. However, one important clincher or clinical finding that we need to remember is that anybody presenting with unexplained abdominal pain and diarrhea can be a case of adrenal insufficiency along with some of the electrolyte abnormalities. So there are some specific clinical features also like hyperpigmentation which are seen only in Addison's disease which is the primary adrenal insufficiency and some patients might present with craving for salt. Now when a patient of adrenal insufficiency presents to you so your first line of investigation would be to measure 9 am serum cortisol. Now this is the initial investigation and because the cortisol levels are highest between 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. due to the circadian rhythm, that's why we measure 9 a.m. cortisol levels. Now the confirmatory test for adrenal insufficiency is your ACTH stimulation test or your synactin test. Now when we give ACTH from outside, in cases of Addison's disease where the problem lies at the level of adrenal gland, despite giving ACTH from outside, the adrenal gland is unable to produce enough amount of cortisol in the circulation. Whereas in the cases of secondary adrenal insufficiency where the problem lies at the level of hypothalamus or the pituitary and the adrenal gland is functioning normally. So when we give exogenous ACTH, it goes and acts on the adrenal glands and produce enough amount of cortisol in the circulation. So this is a confirmatory test and also helps us to differentiate between primary and secondary cases of adrenal insufficiency. The treatment of adrenal insufficiency involves the replacement of deficient hormones that is your glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoids. So for glucocorticoid replacement we use hydrocortisone and for mineralocorticoid replacement we use fluidrocortisone. However in the case of an acute presentation of adrenal insufficiency that is your Addisonian crisis which is a life-threatening condition due to severely low cortisol levels, the patients may present with conditions of shock and abdominal pain along with hypoglycemia. The mainstay of treatment for this situation involves the replacement of fluid by giving IV fluids along with IV hydrocortisone which is given 100 mg stat followed by 8 hourly doses which can be given either IV or IM. The treatment also involves correction of hyperkalemia by giving calcium gluconate and hyponatremia which resolves after giving IV fluids. If the patient is hypoglycemic, we infuse IV glucose and we wait for the condition to improve and if the condition improves within 72 hours, 
then we switch to oral steroids. So today we have Dr. Jagyasa with us who is a great friend of mine and has recently passed Flap 1. So we will be discussing some clinical scenarios regarding the topics we have just discussed. So our first clinical scenario is... So our first case of the day is a 33-year-old woman who complains of fatigue and proximal muscle weakness. She has noticed purple stri on her abdomen which has become more prominent over the past few months. The creases of her skin are becoming more hyperpigmented especially at her palms. She has been increasing in weight. Recent blood results show hemoglobin of 130 gram per liter, sodium of 141 millimole per liter and potassium 2.9 millimole per liter. Random morning serum cortisol measured is high. What is the most likely diagnosis? So in this question, we see that the patient presents with uh, common yet non-specific symptoms of mm. fatigue and weakness, uh, supported by hyperpigmentation, which is a very characteristic feature of Cushing's. Along with a few electrolyte abnormalities like hypokalemia and um, however, there might be normal or raised sodium levels. Yeah, so all right, that makes sense. Because the patient has Cushing, so there is excessive aldosterone, which causes sodium and water retention and potassium excretion. So the person can have either normal or raised sodium, but the patient will definitely have a low potassium. So mm -hmm. the patient will be hypokalemic. True. And along with that, there will be hyperpigmentation. So hyperpigmentation will be present in all cases of Cushing's. So it is entirely specific for ACTH dependent Cushing's. All right. So ACT in ACTH dependent Cushing's, the patient will have hyperpigmentation because mm -hmm. ACTH will stimulate MSH that MSH, is melanocyte yes. secreting hormone. Mm -hmm. Alright, so could you elaborate us a little bit on the tests of Cushing's because there are some tests which are diagnostic tests or initial tests and there are some to localize the cause. Mm -hmm. So what about that? So the initial or the confirmatory test could uh, be either of the following. Uh, 24 hour urinary cortisol levels or your uh, midnight um, dexamethasone test or uh, your midnight uh, salivary cortisol levels as well and uh, however it is said so that um, two of uh, the two of their readings as in if one of the readings come po comes positive we need to perform another test to confirm the diagnosis with two positive readings all right so tests. you mean that if we perform an initial diagnostic test and it comes positive so we can perform any of the other or the same mm -hmm, initial diagnostic true. test and that confirms the Cushing's. But however, I think this is not what you need to remember for the exam. And you just need to know that these are the initial tests. Mm -hmm. And I think that's good to go. So our next case is a 12-year-old boy who is clinically obese and is the shortest in his class. His medical history includes having a renal transplant two years ago. There are purple stri noticed on his skin. What is the single most likely diagnosis? So in this question, uh, since it's pretty evident that the diagnosis is that of Cushing's, we need to try and understand the physiology behind it and that is iatrogenic or non-ECTH dependent Cushing's, um, uh, which is basically long-term exposure to exogenous uh, steroids. In this case, particularly uh, post-renal transplant for the case of immunosuppression. Yeah, all right. So you mean to say that if there's a patient who is on a long-term steroid treatment, mm. so he is prone to develop Cushing's because, and yeah, that makes sense because for non-ECTS dependent Cushing's, exogenous steroid administration is one of the most common causes. Yes, definitely. Yeah. A 23-year-old woman presents to the female health clinic with secondary amenorrhea for a duration of 10 months. Her BMI is 30. She has dark pigmentation on her neck and severe acne on her face. She complains of feeling weak and lethargic. Blood tests reveal a serum potassium level of 2.5 millimole per litre. What is the single most likely diagnosis? So here the female presents with features of um, secondary amenorrhea and uh, acne on the face and hyperpigmentation on the neck. Uh, basically, signs and symptoms falling under various conditions, one of them being PCOS. However, it is not supported with the Rotterdam's criteria or the question doesn't provide us with uh, the LH and FSH ratios. Alright, so I was a little confused and I thought the answer is primary hyperaldosteronism, but mm -hmm. 
It's not. So mm -hmm. how would you choose? Why would you choose hyperandrogenism? See, uh, focusing on the clincher here, which is that of um, hypokalemia, we look out for uh, the option of Cushing's disease. However, um, even hyperaldosteronism presents with hypokalemia, but it typically presents as hypertension with hypokalemia. Like that is the clincher that helped me solve the questions. So our last case is a 38-year-old lady who was admitted with severe abdominal pain and diarrhea. On examination, hyperpigmentation is noticed at her palmar creases and buccal mucosa. She has muscle cramps and joint pain. Her blood pressure is 79 over 50 mmHg. Her blood results show a sodium of 129 millimole per litre, potassium 5.4 millimole per litre and random plasma glucose of 3 millimole per litre. What is the single most likely diagnosis of this case? In this question, we see features of severe abdominal pain and diarrhea. Uh, which are the non-specific features of uh, Addison's disease. However, other features are quite similar to Cushing's. But focusing on the electrolyte abnormality here, which is uh, hyperkalemia and hyponatremia, typically occurs due to mineralocorticoid deficiency. All right, yeah. So because aldosterone is the mineralocorticoid mm -hmm. and aldosterone, if aldosterone is not there, so there will be no sodium retention. So there will be hyponatremia and there will be no excretion of potassium. Yes. So there will be hyperkalemia. Mm -hmm. All right. And also, I think patients of uh, adrenal insufficiency very commonly present with abdominal pain and diarrhea. So yes. that is also a clincher along with the electrolyte abnormality. I think it's a pretty straightforward question. Yeah. Thank you. I hope we could make it easier for you to clear your concepts and in case you enjoyed, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And stay tuned to our Plowable YouTube channel for upcoming teaching videos. Thank, Thank you, you guys. guys.